Today we are going to be in 1 John, uh, verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to come to your house and have your word proclaimed. Um, I'm so thankful that we live in a place where we can do this without uh, fear of prosecution, but we can come freely and openly and worship and praise you. I pray that your message is on Adam's lips this morning, and we have hearts and minds to hear it and uh, let it affect our lives. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. If you haven't already, go ahead and take a seat. How are we doing this morning? Who's excited about being in the house of the Lord today? I am too. I'm excited as well. Um, looks like, uh, you know, I've, it's, it's still a little surreal for me being here just because you know, I feel like, you know, I haven't, haven't put down roots or anything like that. Um, but that is changing. Hopefully we are going to be closing on our house this Friday. So, um, yeah, we're excited about that. And so um, I'm just letting you know if you've got nothing to do on Saturday and you want to spend a couple hours maybe helping me empty out of storage, uh, that would be great. And I'll make a deal with you. If we get my, my, my storage unit emptied out on Saturday, I will wear a tie on Sunday. Because I could get to my, mostly because I can get to my ties. How about that? If not, I think I might wear shorts and Hawaiian shirt. so... Uh, the only problem is if I do that, then they'd have to adjust the lighting here because the light off of my legs would just like blind everybody. Okay, that's enough information. Sorry about that. Good morning, Shiloh Hills Fellowship. We're all excited here. Let's, uh, let's see if we're still feeling that way after our message today. <laughs> because to today we are going to be uh, looking at a topic a subject that no one really wants to talk about or most of the time really even wants to acknowledge, and that's this, sin. Uplifting and inspiring, right? Well, you know what? It is when we see sin in its proper context because an honest and correct understanding of sin, which is what we're going to start looking at today, an honest and correct understanding of sin points us to our need for a Savior. See, um, while sin is a part of what we're going to be exploring today, it's really within the far greater context of the overall subject of John's letter, and that's Jesus. John wants us to understand Jesus, his life, his ministry, his purpose. And in order to do that, in order to think about Jesus correctly, we also must understand sin correctly. Because if we get it wrong, if we try to minimize or deny sin, then we're also minimizing and denying the need for the Messiah. So, question, who here knows what gaslighting is? Probably heard it before, right? Gaslighting, in its simplest terms, is deception through manipulating someone into making them believe that what they're seeing, seeing or feeling isn't real. It's their perception of reality is incorrect. And so, if you say something like, hey Adam, why'd you take off your glasses? And I respond with, I don't wear glasses. Right? This is me trying to, to gaslight you. But if I'm convincing enough, right, if I deny it enough times, I have no idea what you're talking about. I have never worn glasses a day in my life. What you have me confused with someone else. There's absolutely no way that you have ever seen me wear glasses before because my vision is perfect. You're all not a blur right now. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not having trouble reading my notes. I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't wear glasses. If I do that enough and I sound convincing enough, then eventually you might doubt your memory and your experience of me and you might start to believe that I don't wear glasses even when I do this. I'm not wearing glasses. I don't know what you're talking about. Now, ridiculous example, right? No one's ever going to really fall for that. But this is a ridiculous example of a type of deception that is very, very common in our world today. 
And unfortunately, it's common even in the Christian world. In many churches, in many parts of the Christian world, it's like we're all subconsciously are agreeing to gaslight ourselves about the realities and the dangers of sin. We try to hide it. We try to ignore it. Or maybe the most popular thing, we try to minimize it. It's not that big of a deal. We all make mistakes, right? I'm this way because of my environment, my upbringing, the culture that I live in. You know what? I just made an unwise decision there. It's no big deal. Even if it's wrong, it's not hurting anyone else. So who cares, right? Well, these kinds of thoughts about sin are probably similar to what John's audience was facing with these false teachers that had come into their churches. These false teachers teachers were too trying to minimize, to ignore, or even deny the reality of sin. And so starting today and going through next week as as well, we're going to be looking at how John responds to this denial of sin. And he does this by giving us three conditional statements that we'll start looking at the first one today. And these conditional statements start with, if we say... And it almost functions like a rhetorical question. It's John pointing to the ridiculousness of what they are saying about sin. Because if you, again, if you don't get sin right, you won't get Jesus right either. And we have to get Jesus right if we want to be faithful to his message, his teachings, and his commands. Knowing Christ impacts the entirety of our lives, our thoughts, our emotions, our actions, everything, our relationships, all of this is touched by our relationship, our fellowship with Christ. First and foremost, because as John says in verse 5, God is light. And so let's start by reading verse 5 again, and then we'll start looking at what John has to say for us today. And so 1 John 1, 5. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light, and there's absolutely no darkness in him. Let's pray. Father God, this morning, as always, we are thankful for the blessing and the gift of your word, the blessing and the gift of this church, of the the universal church, of the fellowship of believers uh, throughout the world and throughout space and time. God, we're thankful for this message that you are giving us today. God, we're even so very thankful that you are light in our lives, even as we come together to learn more what that means so that we can better praise and honor, worship and serve you because of it. Help us to see these things. Help us to know them, to understand them, and help us to live them out in our lives and in our community. All these things we ask in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right. So after this extended introduction that we looked at last time, John, he he wastes no time getting to the main point, the main rebuttal of what these false teachers were peddling. God is light. There's absolutely nothing of darkness in him. This is like the first big thing that he wants them to to know and to understand. And so what does this mean? And how do we know that this claim is true? Don't hit my microphone. So first, let's let's try to put ourselves in the minds of, of John's original audience, the people that he's writing to. They were dealing with an incorrect understanding of spiritual and physical things pushed on them by false teachers who were setting themselves up as these profoundly spiritual people with a deeper, more mysterious understanding of God and the world. And these teachers were leading them down the wrong path. They were leading them away from God instead of towards God. And so John has to respond to these things, and he starts by acknowledging that in one way, these false teachers had gotten something right. right? There is a fundamental duality. There is a split in the world. But it's not between the physical and the spiritual. It's between light and darkness, good and evil, righteousness and immorality, truth and falsehood. This is the split that we need to understand because you can only be on one side or the other. You can't toe the line. You can't split the difference. You can only be on one side or the other, and that's because, first and foremost, God is only on one side. And that's the side of light. 
God is goodness, true knowledge, holiness, righteousness, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But first, we see here John makes a point to clarify that what he is telling them in in contradiction to what these false teachers were saying, what he's telling them is reliable and true, and we can know that it's reliable and true because he heard it from the lips of God directly, from the mouth of the Messiah, Jesus. Unlike these false teachers, his message, the message of the apostles, the message of the gospel, is a message about God that can be trusted and relied upon. Because they heard it from Jesus himself. This wasn't a product of their imaginations. It wasn't a product of their study into the deeper mysteries that weren't available to everyone else. No, God, in the person of Christ, taught them this truth directly face to face. And this reinforces what we started to talk about last time as well. right? Since the theology is the study of God, it has to be, it must be anchored and grounded in truth. Objective truth, not subjective feelings or beliefs. Theology is about what God has clearly revealed throughout history and how that plays out in the world. Which means that any claim to special revelation, special wisdom, deeper insights, any claim to that, apart from God's revelation of himself and his word, it has to be evaluated by what we know to be true. And that's the word of God, especially Christ's revelation of himself and his ministry. One example of this playing out, Acts 17, 11, and 12. The people here were, more noble, were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, since they received the word with eagerness and examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Consequently, many of them believed, including a number of the prominent Greek women as well as men. Right? The only reliable truth we have about God is that which God has revealed to us. And also application point here as well. Look at what John says about what he and the other disciples did with this message, message that they heard from Jesus. Right? They declared it. They took the message to the people who needed to hear it. The purpose of of the gospel is to be delivered, declared, to shine forth into the world, not to be hidden away. And any quote-unquote truth that isn't meant to be shared, any truth that isn't found or isn't based in the truth of the gospel, that's only accessible to a few, that's not the message from Christ. No, the purpose of the gospel is to shine forth into the darkness. And we as messengers are meant to be shining that light in and through ourselves. Jesus taught this in Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. John's telling us that God is light in the world like this. So let's, let's park here and spend some time on this because this is a foundational concept that we're going to see in John's letter. It touches on so many things actually in Scripture throughout, and that is God is light. So what does that mean? Well, John is making a connection here. He's deliberately connecting to what he talked about in his gospel. And he's saying just as Jesus is the light... The Father, as well, is divine light that shines forth into the darkness and illuminates truth and life for all to see. So this is a theme that we see throughout Scripture, light representing good qualities, especially in character or in connection with the character and the attributes of God. His glory, his presence, his working in the world are often pictured in terms of light, like brightness or fire, which are used to describe his presence and his works. A couple of examples. Exodus 13, 21, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to lead them on their way during the day and a pillar of fire to give them light at night so they could travel by day or night. And then Psalm 104, 2, he wraps himself in light as if it were a robe, spreading out the sky like a canopy. 
God is light. And his light, whether it's about his glory or the life that he brings with his truth and his righteousness into the world, his light works to shine forth and eliminate darkness. Not just physical darkness, but spiritual darkness as well. 2 Samuel 22, 29. The Lord, or Lord, you are my lamp. The Lord illuminates my darkness. And so John is bringing all of these thoughts, all of these ideas to bear when he starts talking about God being light here in 1 John. God being light means that he illuminates, he exposes truth, and that he is the source of spiritual and eternal life in the world. Again, back in John's Gospel, a couple of examples in John 1, verses 4, and then verse 9. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Right, so let's try to put all this together then. What John is saying here in verse 5 is that God is the source of light in the world, that truth and righteousness, goodness, and especially life, that all of this is from him, it's grounded in God, and that Jesus, being God, is also the source of light for us. His mission, his purpose, was to bring that light into the world. And because God is light, by by definition, there is nothing of darkness within him. There's nothing of darkness about him, because darkness is the absence of light, and and darkness pictures error, imperfection, unrighteousness, sin, death. And so being light, then, God stands in direct opposition to everything that is not life-giving in this world. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of of Jesus Christ. So this is the great divide. This is the duality of existence. Not not the physical and the spiritual, but light and darkness. Good and evil, life and death, truth and falsehood. So then we have to ask ourselves the question, what does this mean in our lives? What does this mean as we live day to day? Well, in applying this truth, one thing that stands out that John's going to touch on throughout this letter is this. If that God is light and not darkness, this means that he has nothing to do with the darkness, with the things of darkness. And nothing he created in the world, nothing he does in the world, and no one he sent into the world can be inherently sinful or wrong or corrupt just by virtue of what they're made of. In other words, since God created this world, this existence in which we live, the physical world, and Jesus came into the world in the flesh, this means that the physical world is not inherently corrupt and evil simply because it's made of matter. This world, this life, it's important. It matters, right? It's not, this world is not irredeemably evil. We are spiritual and physical beings. And eternity includes a new heaven and a new earth where we, be, where we will be spiritual and physical beings for eternity. We aren't waiting for the chance. We're not sitting around waiting for the chance to, to shed the physical and enter into some sort of spiritual, ethereal existence where we float around on cl- our clouds playing harps all day. And speaking of which, how can you play a harp if you're spiritual, right? I don't know. A spiritual harp. What is that? I, don't, I have no idea. Any, what we do in this life matters. John is pushing this home. This world will be redeemed, recreated, returned to what it was intended to in the beginning. This world matters. And as Maximus Decimus Meridius said in one of the greatest movies ever made, which is Gladiator, and if you haven't seen it, you should, He made a very important point in the very beginning of the movie. He says this, what we do in life echoes in eternity. We have real, significant, eternal 
work to do in this world, in this life. And we can't do it properly if our main focus is on leaving and to going to be with God in heaven. Paul says, to live as Christ and to die as gain, yes. But to live as Christ means that while we are in this world, we need to be dedicated to living for his mission. Because it matters. Ephesians 2.10 For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. It's this idea that John is focused on here. What we do in this life, whether we are walking in the light or walking in the darkness, what we do in this life matters. In other words, who we truly have fellowship with matters. Because you can't have fellowship, you can't have relationship with both light and darkness. It's one or the other, because these are in opposition to each other. And that's what he starts talking about in verses 6 and 7. So let's read those again. 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. If we say we have fellowship with him, And yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and are not practicing the truth. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. So that's, here's that first conditional that we said we were going to look at, if we say. And I was tempted to do, spend a lot of time talking about, you know, what these false teachers might have been saying, what they might have been teaching, what they might have believed, and, and all of that. But you know what? A lot of that is just speculation, and we don't really need to get into that in depth. And so instead, I think we would be better served to just compare and contrast what John means by darkness and light, and walking in darkness and walking in light, and what that means, what that looks like, how that plays out. So let's start by looking at what walking in darkness means. What does it mean to walk in something in general? John, you know, is he talking about, you know, walking around? And if we're walking in darkness, right, we have our eyes closed, there's no lights on, and we're just walking around, stumbling in the dark? Well, in some ways, that's the picture that he's trying to give us, but not quite all of it. So in order to get at what he's going at here, we have to understand what Scripture means when it talks about walking in something. And so to walk comes from a Greek term, peripateo, You don't need to remember that. And it means to walk, duh, or to live or behave in a customary manner or to go about doing. And John's using the second and third definitions, especially the second one here. That's what he's getting at here. To walk in something like this means to live your entire life, body, soul, spirit, mind, everything that you are, to live in a way that is characteristic of the thing that you're walking in. In other, in other words, your life is exemplified by what you walk in. Proverbs 8.20 I walk in the ways of righteousness along the paths of justice. So to walk in something means to live in a way that is consistent with the identity, the values, and the practices of that thing. And John starts by talking about darkness. Walking in darkness means to walk and to live in a way that is consistent with darkness, which we already know means the absence of light, both physical and spiritual. In biblical terms, this kind of darkness is equated with evil, Hades, gloom, hell, the abode of the dead. It's the absence of any redeeming characteristic, any quality of life and goodness or righteousness and truth. Walking in darkness is pictured as living in opposition to the light, in opposition to good. In Proverbs, when speaking about wisdom, it describes walking in darkness like this. Proverbs 2, 12 through 15. It, meaning wisdom, will will rescue you from the way of evil, from anyone who says perverse things, from those who abandon the right paths to walk in the ways of darkness, from those who enjoy doing evil and celebrate perversion, whose paths are crooked, whose ways are devious. So, we need to see this. Walking in darkness, it's not about occasional sin. 
It's not about seeking to do good and sometimes failing to resist temptation and sinning. We've all been guilty of this. But walking in darkness pictures a lifestyle where you are deliberately and willfully choosing evil, gloom, opposition to God. You're choosing that as your total sphere of existence. It's a lifestyle that utterly rejects the light and all things associated with it. So, if you seek to serve God and sometimes fail, you struggle, you don't resist temptation in the moment, this isn't walking in darkness. Walking in darkness is a wholehearted and willful embrace of all that is opposed to the light, all that is opposed to God. And this is important because this is what fellowship is. This is what John is picturing for us when he talks about fellowship. It's that walking in something. Relationship, close connection, companionship, being defined by mutual purposes and goals. This is the picture that Scripture gives us when it talks about fellowship. And so John is warning these churches here that, hey, you know what? If your life is characterized by darkness and you try to claim fellowship with God, a lie. Because you can't walk in opposition to God and claim relationship with him at the same time. In other words, your actions display your heart. You are, in many ways, you are what you do. And God is just as concerned about what you do as he is what you believe. And so if you aren't practicing the truth when you claim fellowship with God, you're walking in darkness. Practicing the truth means that you seek to understand and live according to what you know to be true. Proverbs 5.21, For a man's ways are before the Lord's eyes, and he considers all his paths. And John is highlighting this, again, to refute what these false teachers were spreading. Right? These false teachers, they misunderstood that dualistic nature of existence. And instead of rejecting darkness itself, they instead focused on the material world. And in one way, this is actually kind of understandable. I mean, many different religious traditions, even many Christian traditions, have focused on the flesh, the physical, right, as a source of corruption and evil. Right? How many groups have practiced asceticism? They deny themselves the pleasure of the flesh. They seek to remove themselves from, from all things in this world, like monks that are sitting out in a cave alone in the desert, just eating like a, a piece of bread and drinking a cup of water a day. Right? Even good self-disciplined practices encourage denying the cravings of the flesh, even periodically just to teach yourself that the physical doesn't control you. But these false teachers, they took it too far, and they mistook the weakness of the flesh for evil itself. Their belief that, was that the physical world would eventually be shed for a pure spiritual existence. And because of that, the physical was evil by nature. And they concluded that because of that, what you did in this life, ultimately, it didn't matter. So you could deny the flesh, practice asceticism, or you could indulge the flesh and do whatever you wanted. And either way, it didn't matter because morality and ethics just weren't that important. Only your spiritual condition, only what you believed, only what you knew, not what you did. And we're going to look at that more uh, next time. Because these false teachers, as we're going to see from what John was saying, they even denied the reality of sin altogether. They said, there is no such thing as sin. And so are we beginning to see why John is so urgent in this letter, why he is so, just so pressed and focused on getting this right? He has to combat this false teaching before it destroyed their relationship with God altogether. And so in verse 7, then, he tells the reader, he tells us what true fellowship means and what it looks like. True fellowship with God is to walk in the light of God. And this results in fellowship with each other, with fellow believers. So let's flesh this out a little bit. What does walking in the light look like in, in contrast with walking in darkness? 
Walking in the light is characterized by habitually living in ways that are consistent with relational knowledge of God. It's a way of living that demonstrates God's light, his truth, his life, his righteousness in every part of your life, both physical and spiritual. Not just belief, but actions as well. It's showing that you believe what God teaches is true, not by just what you say, but by how you live, your actions. Galatians 5, 22 through 24, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. We should strive for perfection in this, even though we know we will occasionally miss the mark. But walking in the light means habitually doing this living this way, so that the light of God is the defining characteristic of your life. So let's let's try to get a a picture of this. Who here is a sports fan? Doesn't matter the sport, just a sports fan. Have you ever known somebody who takes that fan and spreads it out to actual, what the actual word means, fanatic, right? Fan is derived from fanatic. And so we've all probably known sports fanatics. You know his favorite team because that's all he talks about, especially during the season, the stats, the percentages, until you're sick of hearing about his fantasy league, right? All that he wears during the season, or maybe even out of season, silkscreen jacket, hat, jersey, maybe even a tattoo, right? We see this. And a side note, if I'm describing you right now, no insult intended, but we might want to talk after service. Well, walking in the light is meant to look like this, a fanatic, not in a negative stereotypical way, but so that you are living in such a way that people look at you And they know that you know God. They see your light like a city on a hill, shining like the stars in the heaven. And if we claim fellowship with God, what John is saying here is that we must walk in light of that revelation, of his revelation, especially as demonstrated in the life and ministry of Jesus. And so the question then that we should ask ourselves, does my life look like Jesus? How much, how well does my life reflect the perfection that we see in Jesus in the Gospels? Not just what you believe, not just what I think, but how I live, my morals, my ethics, my day-to-day actions. Am I a Jesus fan? How much of his merch do I have? How much of that do I wear in public? Not literally. It's a picture, remember. We'll get back to that in a few moments. First, though, notice what what does John say about fellowship here in light of walking in the light? Because it's not what you might expect. He doesn't say that walking in the light results in fellowship with God. He says that walking in the light means that we have fellowship with one another, right? Right? In other words, fellowship with God, walking in the light, it will naturally produce, end up, result in fellowship within the church. Again, we looked at Christian fellowship a little bit last time, but let's expand on that. Fellowship, interconnectedness, sharing values and purposes and goals. In the church, this must be created and nurtured by our common point of connection. And that's this, salvation. And the presence and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in our community. If we come together for any other reason other than to worship and serve God, then we aren't the fellowship that God intends for us. 1 Peter 2.9 But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness 
into his marvelous light. So in case you didn't notice, I'm new here, right? So I don't know the history of this church in in minute detail yet. But this is a danger that churches around the world have faced since the beginning. Fellowship based on anything other than Jesus. For the churches that John was writing to, they face the danger of fellowship based on spiritual elitism, secret, hidden knowledge, viewing others through how much access they had to that supposed superior wisdom. And those with this supposedly superior wisdom, this revelation from God, apart from Scripture, they lorded it over the lesser ones. Not because they wanted to teach them and these guys were just incapable of learning and understanding, but they lorded it over them because they just reveled in the power, the prestige, the superiority that they thought they had. And this is still a danger in the world today. Spiritual elitism, relationship relationship based on training or knowledge, focused solely on gaining more and more insight This doesn't build fellowship, it destroys it. I will say this now and always. I am not a better Christian or more loved by God because my knowledge of the Bible may be a little bit more in depth than yours. Being able to articulate doctrines like the hypostatic union of Christ in great detail doesn't mean that you are in closer spiritual communion with Christ. It's not a bad thing in and of itself, but it doesn't mean that you are a better Christian if you can. Jesus is the only Superman that this or any church will ever need. And our fellowship must be built upon relationship with Christ the foundation of knowing and following and worshiping him together. Because fellowship based on anything other than Christ doesn't take care of the problem that we all have, which is what? Sin. Circling back to where we started, tackling the problem of sin isn't achieved through denying its reality. It's only achieved through falling on the mercy of the one who dealt with it through his own sinless, perfect righteousness. John points us squarely to the truth here in this verse. Christ, in his blood, his death on the cross, is the only means by which we can be delivered from the power of sin and death. No matter what anyone says, no matter how deep and mysterious your wisdom and your learning may be, in the end, We're all sinners saved by grace. Romans 6, 22 and 23. But now, since you have been set free from sin and have become enslaved to God, you have your fruit, which is the result in sanctification, and the outcome is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not in how much I know, not in how much wisdom I have, Not on how many years of schooling I have. Not on how I feel. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And fellowshipping with one another is about coming together based on that freedom in Christ. Through our recognition that he has released us from the bondage of sin and death through what he did on the cross. Taking on the flesh, living a sinless life, showing us what it means to walk in the light through his own righteous example. His light, not our own. His light is the foundation of fellowship in God's kingdom. Romans 3, 22 through 25. The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, since there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented him as the mercy seat by his blood, through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness Because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. 
So, as we're closing up our time here this morning, again, the question that we have to ask ourselves, what do we do with all this? It's great to know, but so what? How do we apply this? How does this change our lives, our community, our fellowship here together? How can we encourage and support each other in walking in light and not in darkness? Well, again, first off, we have to accept what it means that the flesh matters. Again, this world matters. In many ways, you are what you do, not just what you believe. And you can't claim to know God if your life demonstrates the exact opposite. If you don't care about cultivating and demonstrating and living in the goodness and righteousness and holiness and knowledge of the truth, then John is telling us here that we don't really know and follow the God of Scripture. Because God makes no distinction between your spiritual condition, what you believe, and your moral condition, what you do. Both are products of the same heart. And so first we have to accept the truth that Scripture teaches. You do what you love. Luke 6.45 A good person produces good out of the good stored up in his heart. An evil person produces evil out of the evil stored up in his heart. For his mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. Walking in darkness is always, always walking in opposition to God. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. I'm warning you about these things as I warned you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So we as a church together, we need to strive to walk in the light. And we need to strive also then to build fellowship based on that relationship with God in the light and walking in it. We aren't a part of this church because we have an intellectual understanding of certain propositions in a book that was written 2,000 years ago. We come together. We fellowship together as a church because we have had a personal encounter with Jesus. We fellowship because he has saved us, forgiven us, cleansed us of sin through his blood poured out for us. It's all about relationship, which means then that in the church we can't look down on or dismiss others as inferior, as less important, as less spiritual, less loved by God, if they aren't as mature or knowledgeable as we are. Instead, we have to seek to build a community based on the foundation of Christ. Forgiveness and healing, love, acceptance, seeing people where they're at, even while encouraging them, yes, to grow in their sanctification and holiness. Because this, sometimes we forget this, especially us more seasoned saints who have known Christ for decades. But this is how we all came to Christ. Broken and bleeding. The end of ourselves. Fully aware of our sin and our need for his grace and mercy and tender-hearted compassion. And as a church, as a fellowship, we have to be willing to share and extend that same grace and mercy and tender-hearted compassion to each other. Walking in the light is a humbling, healing, renewing, and enlivening experience. It's impossible to be arrogant and boastful in fellowship with God. That's because we all come to him utterly broken acknowledging our own mistakes, our problem with sin, that we can't fix 
ourselves. Yet when we have true fellowship with him, our focus isn't on the darkness, it isn't on the past, it isn't on the sin, it isn't on the brokenness, it's on him. And the life-giving light and transformation that he brings and offers to everyone. So let's walk in the light together in fellowship around the only thing that truly brings light and life and joy into this world, Christ. Pray with me. Father God, this morning, we are so, so thankful for this reminder of your love. A love that we can't comprehend. And at the same time, a love we so desperately need and rely on. That you are light. The light that brings life to the world. And we want to be your children. In your light together. Walking in fellowship with each other, even as we fellowship. So God, help us in that. Help us to see what it means. Help us to see how to apply this, how to live in this. Help us to be a church that's united around our identity as sinners saved by grace. Actually, former sinners, formerly belonging to sin and death, but now set free by your love and what your son Jesus did for us on the cross. Help us to see this, help us to understand it, and help us to live humble, joy-filled lives with each other in light of it. As always, we ask these things in the name of your son Jesus Christ. Amen.